Hey everybody. Hey, yeah. Hearing a little bit of I need thee. I come Here I come I come to thee Here I come Here I come Lord To thee You know, with all the change I've made uh, over the last several years, I never lose my value or appreciation or sincere reverence for the transcendent moments I had as a classical Pentecostal worshiper all my life, four generations. And even though some people say I'm off and I'm a heretic and I'm an end time false prophet, I don't really pay that much attention to those kind of terms. I used to use them too. I know what I know. I know what I believe. I know why I believe it. I know what I feel. I know what I experience, not just outside, but what I feel about me. Remember, life starts and stops with how you experience yourself, how you believe in what you believe about you and how that manifests in your life. This is 2018. I believe it's the year of manifestation and things are already manifesting in very powerful words. I talked about if you heard me uh, talk on New Year's Eve or that message around that time, that this is going to be a year of exposure, uh, more exposure. For the next little bit, we're going to learn a lot about ourselves. There's going to be a lot of purging, a lot of, a lot of remedial healing and cleansing. And I'm going through this body tox right now, this Daniel's fast. But it's not just physical detoxification. It's also emotional and, and psychological and in some way religious detoxing. Toxic just means poison. The things that are unhealthy to the soul, unhealthy to the mind. And um, I'm growing up. I'm, I'm approaching my 65th birthday and uh, that... That's important to me of the many, many birds because it basically says I'm a well done adult, not just, you know, I've, for many, many years I went with this young, uh, you know, rising apostle, this young preacher, this young evangelist. <laughs> Ain't nobody saying that no more. <laughs> Every once in a while I go into a place of business, even with this gray, and the person will say, well, what can I do for you, young man? And I say, say that again. You could keep saying that, you know, because that sounds good. And when I think about it enough, it feels good. But I know that I'm um, that I have more behind me than in front of me. But the greatest days I think are in front of me as far as substantive impact upon the planet. I want to say something for a minute. And there's so much to talk about tonight. So much in the news, as you know, I'm a news buff. I watch it constantly. We know that President uh, Trump said something stupid again today. But it shows who he is, and I'm not I'm not really upset about him thinks anything he says or does. We know him now. I'm concerned only about his followers, his base, because he's always feeding his base and they take what he feeds them. That's critical. That's a concern because most of those are, are conservative, faith-based people, people that I spent 50 years of my life hanging out with, uh, pastoring and serving and working with and walking with. And obviously there's, there's some grief in me around all of that because I see that there's a lot of racism and misogyny. There's no growth. It's not the Christ character in many of them. Uh, in their appraisals, and they're holding on. They're his base. They're asking, does his base like this? I'm telling you, Christians and evangelicals, you're about to be scrutinized at a level you've never been scrutinized. It's going to be hard to fill Christian colleges in the, in the near future and religious institutions because nobody's going to want to be associated with evangel evangelicals. They're not going to want that on their portfolio. They're not going to want to say they graduated from the beloved ORU like I did. And many, many people, I'm, I was proud. I'm still proud. I'll always be to a certain extent, but then I have to explain what that means. Because the stigma of being conservative is being associated with stupidity and ignoring Christ or Christian principles. So I want to talk about cognitive dissonance, which is something I'm experiencing personally and have for many, many years. Many people that I respect, ministers particularly, uh, bishops, leaders of movements and pastors of churches and founders, people I've ordained 
or consecrated to the bishopric or ordained and in, in, uh, installed in pastorates, deacons, elders, leaders. Cognitive dissonance is the state of having inconsistent thoughts or beliefs or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioral decisions and attitude changes. The, there's an inconsistency going on in the mind of many people, sort of a schizophrenia, thinking two or three different ways, or the scripture says a double-minded person is unstable, doubt, a doubting or doubling. One's D-O-U-B-T, the other's D-O-U-B-L-E. A doubting person is a person who doubles back and forth. You have two different opinions. How long are you going to be halt between, the scripture says, two different opinions? Um, we're struggling right now, and many people are, are on the verge of nervous breakdowns. I think Donald Trump is basically having a public nervous breakdown. I think he's, 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 uh, he's exploding publicly. I think he's stressed out. I think he's, he's, um, it's, it's, there are signs of, of instability, mental instability. I don't care what you say. Just this recent book that came out, he's pressure under that. His son and son-in-law are uh, possibly uh, under indictment or going to be indicted. 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 He's going to have to to talk to the Congress and maybe a grand jury. Um, and he's not good on his feet. He says the same thing. His his vocabulary is very limited. Uh, how did he ever get in the White House? He got there because his base wanted change in this country. They thought they were losing control and they wanted to gain control again. The scripture says the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the whole world and all they that dwell here, therein. American Christians in particular think they own the world. They're supposed to first own America and then reach the world. They think the term go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature came from London, from Britain, from King James, not King Jesus. <laughs> they think those are the words of the Anglo leader who himself was confused and frustrated. It's King James, I think the third of England and the first of London, uh, of, of Britain, and he says, his mother is Mary, Queen of Scots. Do the, do the history on it. He was, uh, the, he was a, a homosexual, a gay man, and he had his first experience, and I learned this when I was studying in London, or in Europe, um, reading, just reading, um, that he had his first experience when he was around 12. He was so feminine, they called him Queen James instead of King James. Now, that's not an assault. That's not a, a criticism. It's an observation for all of you King James Version Bible uh, toters and quoters who hate gays. Well, the man that gave you that book, with the King James on it, was gay. Now, what you going to do with that? <laughs> it's like what I had to think when Versace was killed. And there's a special coming on about him. And I used to wear his fine, paying, you know, four or five, $600 for those blazers back in the day when I was single. I led many people to Christ in those uh, Versace dress meets, so to speak. I stood on those stages with those beautiful jackets on and led thousands to Christ. And a gay man, I, well, I didn't know he was gay until they killed him. I wasn't thinking that way. And then I think, well, because my attitude was a little bit suspicious and slight, I changed it. I've changed so many attitudes. I'm, I'm so happy to, that this cognitive dissonance thing has made me stop and rethink what I believe and why, why I believe it. In the field of psychology, uh, a cognitive dissonance is, 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 is the mental discomfort. And I know, I think many of these conservative Christians who has put Trump in there are having a lot of mental discomfort and stress. They're young people in particular. The children and grandchildren of this generation are going to look back with shame and embarrassment and not going to want to be associated. Some of these parents are going to be shocked. You think it's normal to have teenagers go their own ways and do their little rebellious things. Even my children have done that to a certain extent. But the kind of mass uh, disorientation and dis disenchantment and detachment that we're going to experience as a result of this is going to, be, it's going to cause a lot of parents a lot of grief. Kids sitting up in those Sunday school classes, those youth groups. Uh, there's some of these powerful young preachers that are anointed and called of God, that are excellent in the pulpit. They have good command of the language. They are good on their feet. They have wit and humor and, and revelation and inspiration and a lot of indoctrination are wrestling right now with a lot of the stuff they're saying. Uh, they're getting bored with their own ministry. So there, there seems to be a little hope because some of them are still wanting to be the next Joel. And the next Jake's or the next Noel or the next Joyce. I understand all that. I lived in that world for so many years. Uh, I've been to the tops of those and those different plateaus. I know what it's like. It's not all y'all think it is. So in psychology, cognitive dissonance is this mental discomfort, this psychological stress experienced by a person 
who simultaneously holds two or more contradictory beliefs, contradictory ideas, two or more contradictory values. This occurs, uh, or the occurrence of this cognitive dissonance is a consequence, it's a result of a person performing an action that contradicts personal beliefs, personal ideas, personal values, and also occurs when confronted with new information that um, contradicts these beliefs, that contradicts the ideals, that contradicts the information highway, you know, the internet, cyberspace, uh, the cloud, the iCloud, the iPad, the iPhone, uh, you know, mine has, if you look, can look at the back of my computer, it has an apple with a bite out of it. Knowledge. It's not, the, it's not good or evil that's the threat. It's the knowledge or the science of good and evil. There is a science to good. There's a science to evil. And I'm not saying they're bad or good. They are there. They're negatives and positives. They have their place in the universe. You have, you have uh, bad bacteria and good bacteria, bad germs and good germs in your body. Everything relates. Everything relates. And I'm learning that. Uh, and there's a beautiful harmony and synthesis and synchronicity to all things that exist. Learning that and flowing with it, I often say, go with the flow and grow with the flow, even when the flow becomes a flood. Keep growing, keep expanding. I'm feeling very good. In a few days, we leave for the Sundance Film Festival in uh, Utah, Park City, Utah, uh, to, as a family. My family is going to first time sit down and watch the full we saw some of the shooting, but they've now put it all together and the film about 90 minutes goes into Netflix and will be released in theaters and Netflix on the same day, sometime this spring, between uh, probably April and May. Uh, we're looking to go into the uh, Cinema Circle, or Circle Cinema here in Tulsa, and, and this owner owns another theater in Oklahoma City. Uh, they'll serve hors d'oeuvres and maybe champagne, and we'll watch the movie together. Then I'll do q and I will go into several cities and do the same thing. I'm thinking maybe 20 or 30 city tour um, whenever we can do that this, this year, but it'll be exciting. Uh, I want to talk about I hope this movie uh, inspires a conversation that people will begin to talk, talk about what they believe, why they believe it, and how those beliefs add to or subtract from the quality of their lives. But we're going to go there. I, get, I think I'm going to get to meet uh, Robert Redford. First, he was originally going to play Oral Roberts. And I mean, he started the Sundance Festival. And if he's there, I'm told that I, that I get to meet him and that he wants to meet me. And Rob, of course, Rob, uh, Robert uh, um, uh, Martin Sheen, who I've already met, had a wonderful conversation. He um, he plays Oral Roberts in the movie, and I'm going to meet Danny Glover for the first time, though he played in the movie, but I wasn't there the day he shot. Um, but we're going to form a panel and do some q and I understand. Um, it's exciting. I've never been to a film festival before. I hope it goes to several of the others. I wish it goes to Cannes, or Kansas, some of you would call it. I show would be going there. Uh, but I, but more importantly, it's not a movie movie as much as I'm excited as is a movement of cre of cultural creatives and spiritual progressives and and sacred humanists, people who are ready to to rethink and redo and help create a new brand new world, a brave and brand new world. Uh, as Aldous Huxley said, I read that book back when I was in high school. I think. Uh, was stimulated by it. I remain uh, curious and excited about the possibilities of a new world. Um, so there's a blatant and subtle dishonesty that I've noticed within the Christian faith and within, within the church world. For, for Donald Trump to say today why, and he's having a meeting with um, a bipartisan meeting in the old office around immigration. Some of the, the uh, senators want to protect immigrants in this country. And Trump all of a sudden just blurts out in front of the group, I think he thought would relate to what he was saying. Why do all these people from shithole countries want to come to America? They're talking about Salvadorians and Africans and Haitians primarily, but not exclusively. Why don't we have more people from Norway coming? He'd been interviewing, entertaining the ambassador to, uh, from Norway to America. So he had Norway, you know, Anglos, uh, intelligent, smart, money, I guess, but it was clearly a racist statement, and the question has been all over the media, how would this play among his base? Well, we know his base are basically white Christians, evangelical Christians, not all, but conservative Republicans, 
and uh, uh, faith-based people who love God, follow Jesus, love the scriptures, go to church. We found out that the, some of the statistics show that the bulk of his, uh, a good portion of his evangelicals are not people who go to church every Sunday. Uh, they're not prayer meeting and Bible study group. They are evangelicals. They'll go a few times a year, maybe to a wedding or a funeral or high holy days or something, Easter. Uh, but they're not general, generally church, but many of the church goers do support him, have support him, and continue to. Even with all the lies they've counted just this week, over 2,000 inaccuracies or lies that this man has said publicly, looking right into the camera, talking right to the fake news person, and just lies. Everybody on his cabinet knows, his family, they all know he lies. And he, he I think he believes his lies. Uh... This is breeding a lot of distrust, some of the cognitive dissonance. Many of the people who voted for him are thinking they made a mistake. The numbers are dropping. This, is, this president has the lowest uh, approval rating of any president in recent history at this time or ever. It's in bad shape. He can't live with that. He can hardly stand it. Um, I think he's freaking out publicly. But the church put him there. What does that say about the church? Soon I'm going to talk about a post-Christian era. I'll get to a little bit tonight. But one of the things I want to refer to is the great falling away because it dawned on me today, I might be part of that. I used to preach about the apostasy, the, the revolt. I don't want to revolt. I just want results. I don't want revolution. I want resolution. I want some resolve. I want to see more clearly. High resolution, high definition, better accuracy of thought and mind. I don't want these crazy, raggedy inconsistencies that we've tolerated all these years with 2,000 years of entrenched indoctrination. Do we really believe this stuff? I posted something today that's gotten a pretty good response. But the play, the play acting and the role playing that these and the dishonesty and the disingenuousness. Uh, the pretension of many so-called believers, they don't really believe. They doubt more than they believe. They have more fear than they have faith. And they sit up in church and go through the motions like clones and clowns. Uh, yes, if that sounds sacrilegious, I mean for it too. I, I think religion as we've known it needs to change. Our attitudes and beliefs in a God with an anger management issue who is vengeful and angry and wrathful and holds grudges. Hell is not just punishment. Hell is hatred. And uh, to believe in a God that a God would even concoct eternal torture flies in the face of, of, of moral character or moral consciousness. How can a loving God, what loving God would actually think of hell? A spanking, a whipping? Who was it? Um, Clarkson, what's her name? A kid. Uh, one of these singers from here in Oklahoma, she, Kelly, Clarkson. Kelly Clarkson recently talked about giving her child a spanking. And a lot of parents understand that. She says they beat him and whip him. And, you know, we got beatings and all beat killings <laughs> coming up in my culture. Uh, nobody thought it was child abuse, though some of it was. Verbal abuse, attitudinal abuse, psychological abuse, physical and sexual abuse occurs in many communities around the world today around the, the sadomasochistic idea of beating and hurting and hitting. But I understand spankings. I think they're, in, they're appropriate at times when, when a child just really doesn't obey the other law, rules that you make. I'd rather uh, spank my son than a police take a billy club to his head, you know, uh, if he disrespects authority. So there's a lot of things we need to do. There's not a leadership that needs to be out there that isn't. I'm surprised these Republicans are probably going to lose big time in this next Mid midterm election because they won't speak up. The over, I think, forty-two or three uh, Republican Congresspersons, senators or or congressmen, uh, men uh, have left office, are retiring and resigning. They know it's going to be an uphill journey. Trump's not helping. He's he's a, he's a, he's a, he's not an asset. He's a he's a liability on the party. He's a liability in this country. I'm just saying it. Uh, I don't hear very many preachers saying this, but, I, but I'm not in very many preachers' churches, but there needs to be a public outcry. And there has been many. Women are angry at their men and men in general. We have pinned the women down, penetrated the women, penalized the women, put them in penitentiaries with our penises. <laughs> I know that sounds rough, but there's an image out there and they're coming after us. 
They're not going to put up with the, the, the chauvinism, the testosterone ego driven antics of, of brute male arrogance any longer. And I can understand that. Uh, there's, there's, there's some very serious issues out there and we need to be confronting them and some, in some ways, combating them. No more playing church, no play acting, um, detoxing, de de detoxifying, ridding myself of my, and my soul of, of emotional and psychological and religious poisons and, and the emotional arsenic of unhealthy and inaccurate thinking and mindsets. This whole Daniel's fast, I've enjoyed it a lot. And again, I love meat. My mom's been cooking neck bones a little bit, and I'm struggling. But I, <laughs> I like meat, but I, but I feel so much better. Uh, I've obviously lost some weight. Uh, but I'm enjoying the fresh fruits and vegetables and, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, mustard greens. Uh, but eating less, smaller portions, getting more exercise, meditating to medicate. The original meditators meditated to get medication to deal with the, the human illness we call life. This, this, the human disease or sexually transmitted disease or disease that we call life. So meditating shows you what herbs and things to use and uh, what foods to eat. We've been digging our graves with a fork. And I have the book almost finished. I'm sorry I haven't given it to you, but it'll work all year long and I'll still get it to you. There's so much happening. So that's what this Daniel's Fast is all about. And I haven't been able to give as much time uh, to you on it, but I think it's just basically a meatless vegetarian type diet, a plant-based diet, I'm trying to encourage you to develop the habit of having at least predominantly plant-based. You don't have to become vegan or total vegetarian and never have a Big Mac or never have a cheeseburger or never have a, a neck bone. Uh, why don't you start by having maybe uh, one meat a week or two if necessary and start cutting back on sodium and sugar. Sugar is, like, sugar is like a poison and I love me some sugar. I mean, I bake stuff and I'm, I haven't been eating sugars lately. I miss it. I want a piece of cake, a sweet potato pies and peach cobbler. I had my sister-in-law call me, Gina's oldest sister. She wanted to know my recipe for peach cobbler. And she and her husband cooked it and loved it and, and uh, it put it in my mind again. So I'm not saying that I don't like these things, but I am disciplining my life because I want to live longer. I want to add years to my life and life to my years so I can be around to help the midwifery that I believe I'm uh, called to with regard to the movement. Again, it's not just a movie that I'm, that I'm excited about. I'm, I'm excited about a movement beyond the movie, before and besides it. So religion, particularly institutional organized religion, is, uh, as most of us know it uh, um, and have experienced it, it's toxic. It's purging. Uh, it needs to be purged out of us. And it's happening by millions of people are not going to church anymore. I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's just what's there. They're not interested. Some of the churches are a little bit more unique. Uh, I speak often several times a year at Spirit and Truth in Atlanta with my friend and one of my spiritual sons in consciousness, D.E. Polk. Uh, very unique service that, yes, they have praise and worship and they'll be able to sing a chant, a Buddhist chant. And Clarice does the responsive reading. It's powerful every week. It's spontaneous and fresh and new and uh, for people who want a worship experience. Some people's worship experience is on a lake or a pond or watching swans or listening to their favorite jazz album, uh, laying on their sofa on Sunday morning. <laughs> I understand all that. I don't think people are going to rush it. And, 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 and create traffic jams for worship services very much anymore. Uh, the church will always exist. There'll always be somebody going to the institution, the organized church. Um, but in general, these big, big mons, uh, mausoleums are going to be that empty. You know, how, is, how are these big places of tens of thousands of seats going to stay filled except a personality driven church? It won't be purpose driven. Denominations tend to be that way, but local churches usually aren't. So anyway, I'm ready to get out of the infectious diseases of thought and mind. Um, there is the tree of the knowledge. I want to talk uh, uh, beyond the toxicity of waste. And I have that in, 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 in the book and I'll, I'll make it available to you because it's not just for the 21 days of this month. This will work for you far beyond it. I posted something today uh, that I want to read uh, to you and talk for the next 20, 30 minutes. Uh, I'm quoting uh, this playwright and, and, and uh, poet and brilliant thinker, Joe Acrocombe. Uh, he says, people would far rather be handed an easy lie than search for a difficult truth, especially if it suits their own purposes. That, that's 
struck me today because I'm dealing with masses of people whom I love. Had I not been in public ministry for the last 47 years, beginning with, with Oral Roberts' television show, but prior to that, I was a young evangelist. I preached, preached a lot in college or throughout college. I preached all over the world to tens of thousands of people, millions by television and radio. Um, I physically stood in front of, of as many as 250,000 on one platform, uh, one stage in Africa. And, and, I, and I, I've preached to huge crowds around the world. I've recorded, I've, I've done the church thing. I've done the religious thing. I've done, and I loved it. I mean, I, I loved it. When I was traveling this world uh, and, and the continents of the world, especially my single days and uh, I came to Tulsa on weekends, almost like a guest speaker and spoke at my church, but I was going everywhere. I was hosting for TBN, uh, their live program, two and three hours. And then I was doing some subsequent programs. I'd go to Poughkeepsie. I'd go up to Seattle. I was in Denver and Dallas and, and, uh, Atlanta. And then I would go over to London and way over to, to Johannesburg, South Africa, Cape Town. I mean, I had a blast. And I loved what I was doing while I was doing. That was my 20th century manifestation. I'm in the 21st century, and I'm not doing the same things the same way anymore. And I'm just as comfortable here as I was there. But I feel more fulfilled here because my vision has expanded. So when, when I read this quote, people would far uh, rather be handed an easy lie than search for a difficult truth, especially if it suits their own purposes. That's a very powerful word because I'm dealing with a lot of people who actually have been believing a lie for decades and millennia. A lot of the stuff we've been taught about God and the Bible are just inaccuracies and none of it can be proved, proven. I believe in transcendence. I believe that uh, the God that exists would be the God that manifests itself to, into, through, and as you in so many ways. That the closest to God you'll ever really get uh, in, is, is self-actualization, knowing who you are. Who your self and soul is, your creative intuitiveness, your ability to produce what you want in life, intentionally or unintentionally. We, we, we create our own realities. I'm trying to get you to do it intentionally, do it deliberately, do it on purpose with purpose. Know what you're creating, know your creative abilities, that we're not just created beings, we're creative beings and creating beings right now. So that's an important tool for you to, to master. And it will take time first to be aware of it and then to master it. But we're moving on. So I'm excited in, in this stage because I believe that a new wave is coming that we've really entered. And I've never, I wasn't into to, uh, the zodiac or astrology and horoscopes and all that stuff. And, uh, but now I'm studying the planets and I've met with people who, are, who consider them uh, Gashwamis, Gashwamis and they, from India, East Indian. I, I, it was an accidental time that I met with him because my wife and I went there to learn about uh, healthy ways of eating, healthier ways of eating. And he was going to give a lecture on plant-based foods, but he wouldn't start the lecture until he let, we let him do a reading, a little astrological chart. So with nobody there but us, I said, well, what the heck? He, re he, he stopped. He said, oh my God, he called the students around. He said, look, you won't see this very often. This, 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 and because they look at the latitude and the longitude and the time that you were born and all that kind of stuff that I don't understand. I have it all written out for that, what he gave me. I've seen him twice since, since not for a reading, but I've met him up with him in Chicago. We ate together and hugged. I love the man. He said, this isn't fortune telling. It's something my family has done for 500 years. It's a science. And he began to show me how they, they do things. It was just mind boggling, but it made a lot of sense. And he spoke a lot of truth that I've experienced. This was 10 years ago that I think I had the reading or 12. And uh, he, he never did get to tell me about diet. I had to study that otherwise. But I, I believe that there are times and that figures and symbols carry vibrations. And that's why I love numerology to a certain extent. The Bible teaches about it, shows a lot about days and numbers and times, whether it's 12 or 7 or 3 or 21 or 40 tribes or 40 gates of the city and 40 uh, years being a generation or what have you. So for the last 18 years or so, I've been going through the deepest and most profound personal, spiritual and theological transition of my soon to be 65 years on the planet. Most of those years steeped in Christian church ideals and ideologies and but I can I can I can no longer honestly say I believe in those ideas and ideologies or accept them as viable truths that I can that I can 
can uh, that work for me. They work on me, but they don't work for me as much anymore. They were powerful when they worked, when my belief system was there. But I, they ran out of juice. This a, it was, a, well, who sang the thrill is gone? We just lost a guitar playing uh, from uh, St. Louis. Thrill is gone, yeah. I forgot his name, but he... Uh, B.B. King, B.B. King, you know, uh, I lost the, the, the energy around it. And I believe in my old language of the Holy Ghost moving me to my next level of expression and experience. And I believe that same spirit or energy or source or choice will move you. So I couldn't, I could not respect realistically, scientifically or spiritually what I was believing. I was being expanded. So do we really believe our old religious formulas? Are they... Uh, working for us and are they producing positive results in the modern world? Look at the effect of Christianity on it. Is the church participating in a giant hoax or perhaps even becoming that hoax? Is there any real hope for the institution we call the church? Is it supposed to exist much longer as it has or is it evolving or dissolving? Is it uh, is it uh, uh, disintegrating, disintegrating? <laughs> uh, you got to watch it. That institution, the church, seems to be living. I heard uh, I read something that John Shelby Spung, one of my very dear friends, he endorsed both my my published Simon Schuster books. I call him every once in a while. He's had some a stroke and some many strokes, and is in. Aspects of retirement now, but a sweet, sweet man. He's tired. He's weathered the storm and the heat of the day. Uh, people just went after him, but he's traveled all over the world. He's one of the most intelligent speakers and thinkers I know. He came to me here to Tulsa when uh, all my members had left and packed my church out of the balcony and everything was full. Buses were coming from everywhere, mostly white people, Episcopalians, Unity, Unitarians, non-Pentecostal, non-Evangelical, non-Fundamentalist people came with a curiosity. We had our choir sing. He loved it. Uh, but the church, he says, seems to be living well beyond its shelf life. I don't expect it to last much longer. In fact, this present election and the debacle around Christians' involvement and engagement with this preacher, this uh, president, uh, is a sign and a wonder. And I, I think it's a sign of the beginning of the end. We have really seen what lives inside evangelicals' minds. Shut it. The DACA thing, these precious young men and women that are productive, there's over 900 of them I hear, or uh, 900,000 or something like that, uh, that have come here with, from immigrant, immigrant, immigrant parents who brought them here illegally, but they were born here. And this is all they know. They pay, pay tax, they graduated from college, taxes. They are, uh, and he wants, the president wants to kick them all out. 200,000 Salvadorians. Wants all the Haitians kicked out. Well, this guy's going crazy. And his base is liking it. He wants to chop America up. What he really wants to do is get all the immigrants, all the, the uh, nationals out, all the people of color out, so it can be, uh, make America white again. I, just, I hate to say that, but, and that sounds racist. And if it is, it is. I think his idea of making America great again just means make America hate again legally. Bullying, mistreating, the arrogance, all these uh, race-baited, um, um, what do you call it, um, um, crimes of uh, uh, based on race. I forgot the term right now. But it's, it's, it's uh, um, their racial biases out there. That energy has been unleashed in this country at levels we've never seen before re in recent years. So, and I, and I think it's stimulated by Donald Trump and the church. Again, I have to keep, because I believe the church needs to be confronted or you need to realize your days are of effective relevance have just about run out. I don't think an election will ever again be dominated. Another president will be put in the White House based on evangelical Christian fundamentalist conservative thinking. This is the last draw. And I think many of you know it. In 30 years, this country... White people are going to be the, the minority in this country. That's fine. I've been the minority for years. We, we've done well, you know. Uh, what, what bothers me is that the same group that so supports Trump hated Obama. For the whole eight years he was in office, the birther thing and Trump uh, 
based in Trump. I was living in Trump residences in Chicago for part of them. Tried my best. I had a contract. Couldn't get out with the owner of the, of the place, the condo we were living in. But uh, he stuck with it. The first African-American president, he tries to dis discredit him the whole time. That right there showed me it was racism. He can't wait to undo anything he did. He's bringing up Hillary's name every other. He is, I think he can't stand the fact that 3 million people voted against him or didn't vote for him and voted for Hillary won by the popular vote. It's the electoral colleges that put him in. He wanted to win by every vote. He can't stand the fact that he didn't have the biggest crowd in, in inaugural history. Uh, out of the box, this guy is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a picture of insanity. Uh, and I don't want to harp on the thing, but the, because I don't see any repentance in the church's mind. I think I'm trying to tell you that the movement that is moving away from right wing evangelical conservative Christianity is the new move of the, of the century and of the millennial millennium. And, uh, it's powerful. People are thinking differently. So, um, remember what you want, wants you. I end it by saying that there's something out there that is, there's, there's an itch that I can't scratch. I, I've never had problems sleeping. I don't lose sleep or lay awake with problems. I never have. I do lay awake with solutions. I, 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 sometimes I can't sleep because my mind is racing towards some idea that I think is fantastic. And when those periods come up on me, I don't try to, to sleep. If I wake up in the middle of the night and my mind is racing, I get up and I write and I listen meditate, sometimes I put on music. Sometimes I go back and listen to my old Azusa music online. I've done that, prayed and cried and spoken tongues for hours. <laughs> uh, it, I get, a, I get a, some kind of high out of it, um, a spiritual transcendence and um, a transformation that's very, very powerful. I become translucent. I see myself and see through myself. I experience myself at a different level and it's just, it's absolutely powerful. So I'm saying that, that, um, the institution uh, that's lived beyond its, its shelf life uh, is going to be replaced with something more spiritual, more relevant, more powerful, more appealing, and more practical. And uh, I don't have to find it. We will, it will find us. It will locate us. It knows where we are because what we want wants us. What you want wants you. So, again, uh, Bishop Sean Spung, my, my cherished friend and mentor, um, he's a retired Episcopal bishop well into his 80s now. The last time I talked with him on the phone, he said, I'm, I'm tired of writing. They want him to keep writing a column. He called me. He said, I'm tired. I just can't. I said, don't write another thing, sir, unless you're inspired to. You have given us so much. We'll be chewing on this for the next several decades. This man has deposited something in the earth and in a lot of souls like me, younger men and women who, who got it. I read his book, Why Christianity Must Change or Die. That's the first John Shelby Spung book I read. I couldn't put it down. And I'm still saying the same thing. He has one called uh, Unbelievable. <laughs> and I read excerpts from Unbelievable too today. The church in large measure is dishonest, he says. <laughs> I say it's disingenuous. It lives and lies in denial, the church does. This is me talking. And in deception. Just because everybody's doing or believing something doesn't mean it's right or that it's true. In, in, in Spunk's book, he's, he says, I am a believer without the words to express that belief. So I ask questions, he says. Can I still be a theist? Is my only alternative to theism atheism? Or can I be a, an atheist who is a theist? Now, I didn't know he'd written that. I've been saying that for a while. I am, a, I am an atheist who is a theist. I just don't believe in the God of the Bible. Ooh, shocking. That one is cryptic and, and confused and conflicted. That one is angry and vicious and vengeant and wrathful and more like Donald Trump. I think that's why evangelicals can follow Donald Trump because he reminds them of the Father in heaven who creates storms according to the scriptures and sucks people up and has people dismembered and disemboweled and taken out of the side of the gates of the city and stoned to death, the father killing his own son because of disobedience. Uh, that God of the Bible is the one who repented or regretted that he even made humanity, said, my spirit's not going to strive with you always. 
Uh, he basically admitted that the Earth Project was a failure and his failure, and he wanted a divorce and got one. So, uh, you know, you won't hear very many people. I, in fact, I've never heard anybody say those things, but I read it myself. And so, again, the cognitive dissonance made me rise up. The alarm went off, and I didn't push the snooze button. I woke up, and then I got up. And I think many people are going to do the same thing, in fact, really are doing. So, uh, Spung asks, is God a being, even the supreme being, or is God an experience in whom we live? I love that. God is an experience, and in some ways an expression, but not a man, you know, in the sky with a scepter and a long beard and a long robe and, you know, sandals and all that stuff, making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. So that's why I say um, um, I'm part of the great falling away, you know, that I think spiritual progressives uh, and cultural creatives and sacred humanists who, who are going to live outside the box and are willing to, to be disturbed, uh, disrupted, interrupted, intercepted. All that's happened to me. I've been, I've been disturbed. My life, my ministry was disturbed. This movie is about that disturbance. And, uh, but it's a beautiful uh, portrayal of, a, of uh, I was the prodigal son, or it would have been my father, who didn't want me to experience what I've experienced as far as losing my ministry and money and almost my house and most of my friends and my place. He and I had worked so hard to get there together. Uh, sometimes we didn't even realize we were working together, but we were in a divine flow. I loved him dearly. I love him today. I was a protege of his. He had asked me when I was 25 years to, to spend 10 years until I was 35 to become president of the university. Of course, I'm not the only one he told that to, but he saw me as potential or saw my potential and it's still there. And I still plan to impact the planet in a significant way. And I don't say that it with braggadocia or with arrogance. I believe it's, I believe that kind of way since I was a child. And so I see now that, that we're at least creating an opportunity for a new conversation in this country about our beliefs. So the great falling away, I'm beginning to, to, to see myself as part of that, that modern and growing occurrence. Wow. Part of the falling away. I used to denounce that as if it was the most demonic move on the planet. Um, Again, today in a meeting in the Oval Office, President Trump grew frustrated with lawmakers when they floated restoring protections for, for immigrants from Haiti and El Salvador and Africa, African countries, as a bipartisan immigration deal. And that's when he flew off the handle and said, why do people from all these shithole nations want to come to America? He was frustrated and angry. And he started cursing in the Oval Office using that kind of foul language uh, in reference to African countries, Haitians, who he wants to kick out of this country, who came here after the earthquake, to go back to the same country and uh, 200,000 Salvadorians. This guy is a maniac. But his base, who are supposedly believers in Jesus, are living the exact opposite a life and values contradictory, antithesis of what Jesus would be doing. He would have voted for Trump. You know, we don't know who he would vote for, uh, but we know he, we don't know, we didn't believe who he wouldn't vote for in that Trump. You know, he wouldn't. He'd vote for Oprah first. <laughs> and I know he would have, I know Oral voted for Obama. He was gone the second time Obama ran, but I talked to Oral about politics a lot. He never publicly addressed it, but I privately had a lot of conversations with him. Um, so now, I don't, I'm not shocked by what Trump did, but I am disillusioned by what his followers do. This is, this is, this is, um, um, this is one of scores of times that, that Trump has been, been sworn into, since he's been sworn into office, to publicly speak crazy stuff that showed what's living inside him. And it also shows what's living inside the church. The church is rotting from the inside. Religion, institutional, organized religion are so out of touch, they're on the, the wrong side of history and of, of the scriptures regarding Jesus. I'm saying that as one who's been among you all my life, church folk. You can't argue. I'm not some novice 
or some atheist from the outside, some some quote unquote liberal person that hates the Bible and God and the church and blah blah. I've been in and among you all my life. I understand uh, the lingo. I understand the nomenclature. I understand the culture and the society and the religiosity. I understand the club rules, the clique rules, the clan rules of being a Christian. I understand what it is to repeat a mantra and uh, to say a few scriptures and supposedly you're born again. Uh, you know, being awakened spiritually has nothing to do with saying a few words or repeating after me. Be merciful unto me, I'm a sinner. That don't save nobody. It doesn't transform anybody. It doesn't transcend. It doesn't uh, uh, translate. It's just words. I know many people who've confessed and professed those words who are monsters, who are not free in any way. Some of them are preachers who lead people into those phrases. Come on, can we talk? I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt and gave it back. Not my faith in a source of force that people call God. Just not the one that I believed it as a kid. I actually fired that one. <laughs> Y'all thought he fired me. I fired it. That one gone. That can't work with me or on me no more. Uh, it didn't work. It's a, too much of a monster. Now, I couldn't have said this with my board of trustees and board of elders and board of bishops. and all. They've all denounced me. They've all, you know, criminalized me. So I can say whatever the... Fripp, I want to say. <laughs> I, can, I, I don't have to answer to those people. And I'm happy. And that sounds arrogant, but it, I don't mean for it to. I mean to sound confident. Uh, this is a new day, and you can get by with stuff. Uh, if Trump can get by with that foolishness, I should be able to say what I'm saying. It makes sense. It makes sense to my soul. It makes literal sense to my cells. So um, I think I think Trump suffers severely from, from a, a conspicuous victim consciousness. And he's very insecure. And I only bring that out because that's what lives in the church. Victim consciousness. Insecurity. Distrust. Suspicion. Elitism. Entitlement. Arrogance. We own America. We're supposed to save the world. We're God's chosen people. When we say we're chosen, that means everybody else isn't. We're the special people. We have a special mission. I understand all that. I said it. I believed it. I was sincere. I misunderstood a lot of it. And I'm rethinking it. Because it is an attitude of arrogance and elitism. And you condescendingly win the lost. And a lot of people in this country are losing their grip on the country. Particularly the evangelicals. And they're freaking out. 30 years from now, probably less. White people are going to be the minority. African Americans. I call them American Africans. Asian Americans. Um, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, they're coming in here from all over the world. And the white control is just about over. And even the women's movement, a new one's coming. They're not going to let men get by with the things we've gotten by with in the past. It's just not going to work. It's not working now. Women are going to rise up. There's going to be a female president in my lifetime. I think it should have been Hillary. But, the, but I... But, I, but I'm glad Trump's there because he's exposing uh, all these haters on the down low. This is a big coming out party for haters on the down low. We're seeing them. We now know what lives in the center of this country, in the core of, of this ethic, in this ethos in America. There's a cleansing. There's a purging occurring right now. He has lanced a boil and the foul stench of all that pus that's been in there all these years is all over the land. We see it in the news every day. We see it in his face. This man is exploding in front of us. And the job, I read something today where, where um, uh, Dobson in, out of uh, Colorado Springs said that uh, Trump is born again. Trump ain't born again. I don't know what these guys are talking about. Him confessing Christ means nothing. I know too many people that have, like you guys, who voted for him. Y'all need some deliverance. <laughs> Y'all they say... My, I think everybody's saved, but y'all, <laughs> my, my aunt used to say, they need saving. She meant they need to be purified. A lot of Christians in the old language need saving. They ain't delivered. They're all messed up with religion, and it's crippling. 
And I know you look smugly at me, oh, poor, 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 poor Brother Colin. He's fallen off the deep end. He's influenced by demons. He's reprobate. He's the end time prophet, and, uh, end time false prophet, and all that. Those that language is fear based stuff, manipulative propaganda, and propagandizing. I've heard it for years. It's kept people crippled uh, for centuries. But nobody's going to be able to get away with it this time. This thing is moving so powerfully in the earth. Nobody's going to be able to escape. It's like the, the mudslides that happened in California today. Happened around 3 o'clock in the morning. Everybody was asleep. There was warnings. But everybody heard the message. They were sleeping their mud. Now, this is not a tornado hitting trailer parks. This is floods and mud and sl sludge hitting 3 and $4 million homes. Ruining them forever and ruining lives. Some of those people will have nervous breakdowns. They're suffering to that. When I sit at the comfort of my home and watch television, I mean, yeah, sometimes I get emotional and I cry watching what's happening. I feel such pain for what's happening in people's lives. Um, but mud and sludge, I, everything's a sign to me. Floods, tsunamis, fires, and water. Fire and water. Uh, the fire signs, the water signs. Of course, I'm into to astrology more than I've ever been. I'm studying and listening to... Um, Planetary sounds. The word pastor really is pa-aster. It has to do with the pastures and with the shepherds that were out in the fields studying the stars in the sky for years. And, and in English, English is a much Heinz 57 language. It's a combination of a lot of words, a lot of languages over the years. And uh, it's a language of associations. So that we study the stars and, and the wise men follow the star, supposedly, um, if you believe all that. Um, Sometimes it's accurate, sometimes it's inaccurate. Some people have mystical experiences. I believe in parallel universes and overlapping realities because I experienced them. Not just because somebody told me I'm using the terminology that I've read and heard about, but the experience was before the terminology was there. I've always had these, and many people have these, they, the old folks used to, he hadn't been around before, he hadn't been here before. They're talking about various aspects of reincarnation. Little children that seem to know something, they're close when they get her to the, the other reality and they seem to grasp something. Now they're calling them indigo children. Uh, Obama's the most noted one because he's born in 1961. My wife's born in the same year. Gina's born in 61. They're, uh, what is it, they turned 56 or something this year. Um, my children are indigo. I'm not. So I'm living with all these strange thinking human beings, my kids and my wife, that whole generation. But I'm intrigued. I become their student. I'm studying, I'm learning from them, I'm listening. Um, they know more about uh, using and manipulating through the, and negotiating through the, 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 through cyberspace. You mention somebody's name, they pick up the phone and Google it and they know everything about them, quick. They know about drugs. My kids know about drugs. Most kids know about pot and, and they, I'm trying to tell them about the birds and the bees and, and they learned about the birds and the bees 10 years before I tried to bring it up. <laughs> so what? How y'all know? They know about drinking and stuff. You know, I was naive. I was sheltered. I didn't. I didn't experience a lot of stuff till well into my thirties. I didn't even think about stuff that other kids my age. I was busy fasting and praying and seeking God and studying the scriptures and building ministry and church and traveling and preaching and crying and fasting and you know that was my whole life. I was gonna die doing that. Then I woke up one day. I was. I was more busy in the work of the Lord than I was the Lord of the work. I didn't really have a relationship with my own soul and my own self. I had a relationship with my crowds and with the church and with the, the bishops and leaders and elders. And I loved them. And I loved the relationship I had with them. But I didn't have a relationship with me. I was ignoring my own soul. Ignorance is not, doesn't always mean to, to not know. It means to not notice or not to make note of. When I stopped. When everything stopped and I lost everything and all the crowds moved away and I lost my property and everything, I, I had to take some deep, hard, reflective looks at my own self. And boy, I'm still doing that. I've not stopped. I've, I'm learning so much about it and I feel really good. So uh, what's, what's, what's occurring, and it's very powerful, is ordained, I believe, by the, the, uh, the, the will of God or the universe or the signs of the times or the signs in the skies or the, the, the planets are aligned, aligned for something powerful. Something very far-reaching. Are you ready for it? 
Keep listening. I'm going to keep talking. I'm putting this on record. I want it out. You know, when people, uh, when Harvard came to Tulsa and took my things uh, away for perpetuity to, to digitize it, and it was collecting dust in it, and I was paying for storage here. Didn't know what would happen to it. When they said, my friend John, John, uh, Dr. Jonathan Watson, who uh, pastors the great um, um, campus church there in, at Harvard, um, he's writing a book, I understand, titled Making Pentecost Pretty About My Own Journey. Can't wait to read it. And uh, But he has all that stuff. He's looked through and studied, and they've learned. And it's in the Harvard Divinity School Library. So my children's children, they'll always be connected to it. That was part of the contract for me to gift it to them. That school has like $49 billion in its endowment, so it's not hurting for money. But I wanted to collect, and then when Gina was with me at the meeting, she asked them, "What? why do you want this stuff? And they said, because uh, he, uh, he fits our model. He fits what we're looking for, for the school. They didn't break that down. I'd like to know what they're thinking, but at least it's there. I'm the only Pentecostal preacher that I know of. And I've got all the footage of all the Pentecostal, a lot of the Pentecostal preachers from the 20th century, the Jakes and Blakes and Oral and Benny and Osborne and John Osteen and Bishop Mears and Ida Hulsa and Juanita Bynum and Jackie McCullough and Ernestine Reams and Richard Hinton and, and Evie Hill. I got all that stuff, them preaching. Fred Price, Jack Hayford, Ivor and Tompkins, Fuchsia Pickett, some of these people you don't know. They're all there. Now they're all... Uh, preserved and reserved in, 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 the, in the library there. I'm so thankful. That's my contribution to them. They could have given me a little something of it, but <laughs> they, they, it was a gift. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. But then the movie's coming out, and I'm not dead yet. That stuff usually doesn't happen after somebody dies. I keep looking at my clock. Am I over time? No, I believe I'm supposed to be here. That's why the detoxing and the cleansing and the purging of my mind and reading and thinking and exercising more and keeping my body in shape and, and not digging my grave with my spoon and uh, deciding that I'm going to eat more healthy and organic things and, and uh, clear out and clean out and do some... I used to talk about colonicking so much, Carmen, when my church for you needs to say, you should name your ministry Clean Colon for Christ. <laughs> I'll be calling you always. And then one time he'd say, softly and gently, Jesus is cold. <laughs> Oh, I left my brains off. <laughs> We've had so much fun over the years. And by the way, he's married. Congratulations, Carl. But there's a lot of uh, ch changes and shifts in the world. Uh, when I was in Thailand, I got a call. Just out of the clear, I was in Thailand, walking down the street in Thailand, and I got a call from Sandra Crouch. I hadn't heard from her since Andre's uh, memorial service. I was so glad to hear from her. I told her I'd come out and, and uh, speak for her one Sunday. Um, I knew her dad and mom. And they were deeply dear friends. In fact, one of the earliest revivals of my life, I was still a teenager. I preached at their church, uh, Nougat's, um, not Nougat's, so many, uh, Christ Memorial in Pacoima, um, California. There's a new arising and a new awakening. Put your arms around yourself or let's close with some some of that. Uh, I, I really like, what do you have, uh, the same song? This is an old song that I, one of the, my favorite songs when I was in the Church of God in Christ. Uh, I need thee, O Lord. Every hour I need thee. It's a well-known song and hymn in the Christian church overall. And I still sing those songs. Oh, bless. That's David Smith on the organ and keyboards. He arranged the whole album for me. I hear my grandmother singing this. My godmother singing this church in Woodland Park, shaking the head and getting happy singing it. I need every hour, every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like that, like that, can be, can be. A oh, I need, oh yeah, the oh, I need the. This is worshipful to me. This is on the album, along with "Let It Be," "Change." You bet. 
Flunder and I singing Thank You, Lord. It's a wonderful world. Our Louis Armstrong singing it. I'm singing it, but it's his words. Oh, bless. God bless you. God be you. Be strengthened with might by God's spirit in your innermost being. Love you. Live you. Walk you. Work you. Make it happen. I trust you. I believe in you. I celebrate you. God bless you. I come to you. I come to you. Yeah. Here I come. Good night. Peace and blessing. To Yeah.